Hi, uh, so my name is Andy Tobin, and I work for an organization called Evanim. And uh, we're, we're trying to solve one very simple problem, uh, which is how you know who you're dealing with online. And uh, if you can solve that problem, that's the root of many, many problems that uh, we have in the online world at the moment around trust and security. Uh, so we're doing that. Um, we're enabling what we call peer-to-peer uh, -peer trusted interactions between people, organizations, and things. And I'm from the new world, as Dave puts it, of uh, what we call self-sovereign identity, which will be- We'll, we'll, we'll hear more about this fad in a moment. Probably. So Shamir, would you like to mention Sure. Um, Don't so be too modest. Tell people where you come from. Uh, so my name is Shamir Karkal. Um, I guess my biggest claim to fame is that I co-founded a startup in the U.S. about eight years ago uh, called uh, Simpo, which was one of the uh, first neo banks. Um, that was acquired by BBVA. I then worked for Tepo here for a couple of years, and I'm currently uh, an entrepreneur in residence at the Omidyar Network. Is that a polite way of saying he sacked you? Because you can <laughs> say it in front of these people. It's it's okay. It's not quite, but it was fun for a couple of years. <laughs> Teppo, tell us where you're from. Yes. Uh, Teppo Paola, BVA, a bank. And I'm, I'm sitting on the sponsor chair, so I'm, I'm not expected to say anything it's a, smart. You're a traditional bank, but you're not a traditional person. I, I hope not, yes. That's very true. And Victoria? Uh, Victoria Richardson. I'm looking after the cross-industry work on digital identity that's going on in Australia at the moment. So it's being led by the Australian Payments Council, but it's inclusive of telcos, of retailers, of fintech organizations, and, and actually we're solving the same problem that Andrew is solving. It's trust online, um, and we're taking a sort of whole of economy approach to doing that. So we, so we have the cross-sector perspective, we have the bank perspective, we've got the entrepreneurial perspective, we've got the crazy new invention perspective. So I think... Hold that thought, Dave, because I, what I didn't mention is that I'm also a volunteer at uh, the iSpirit Foundation, which runs, which basically created Aadhaar in India. And I think that's probably the most important perspective for this group. So the, yes, that is a good perspective as well. Is there a weird noise coming from somewhere? Who, who's doing that? Because it's not funny. Can you... Okay. Uh, I tell you what, can you, yeah, can you turn them off for a second when you're not using them to it's be easier? Uh, okay, right, so uh, let's get started with the first questions. What? Oh, this is, it's me that was doing it. Testing, testing, one, can you hear me? Is this thing on? Oh, okay. I don't, I, I, am I loud enough anyway? You don't, I don't really need this, do I? Okay, so I can use it as a pointer instead. That would be a good thing. So um, <clears throat> I want to start with the really big picture. If we were having this discussion 10 years ago and we'd be talking about identity, everybody would be thinking about convert, you know, passport, you know, driving license, that kind of thing. The Marshall McLuhan, the guy that invented media studies, said, and by the way, he said this in the early 1960s, or long before, he said, in a networked world, the conventional ways of knowing who people are just don't work anymore. We can't just take passports and driving licenses. That hasn't worked, right? And a, so we have to have these different approaches. And broadly speaking, I would categorize them as a kind of centralized approach, which has its merits, a more federated approach, and perhaps a very decentralized approach. So I just want to give people some high level on that before we begin to explore the different possibilities. So Shamir, explain to us why India opted for this centralized platform and how it's working out in practice. Well, I guess, um, the, um, in some ways, I sometimes think that it's very easy sitting in the West to, to talk about sort of um, digital identity um, and, you know, all the trade-offs on privacy and some of uh, data collection. And in, in large parts of the world, uh, whether or not you have access to a digital identity, uh, whether, you get, whether you can avail government services, is literally the difference between life and death. Um, so in, in India, for example, um, I think India did it because it really had no choice. Um, there's no other way to take a nation of 1.3 billion people and provide them services without doing it at a massive scale. 
Um, and definitely none of the decentralized solutions work at that scale yet. Um, and uh, they definitely didn't work like eight, nine years ago when Aadhaar started. So to put it in perspective, uh, the Aadhaar project started in 2009. And between 2009 and now, there is uh, a centralized database of identities, 1.1 uh, billion people, uh, which has cost roughly $1 per identity to populate that has biometrics. We need to drive a stake in the ground around that because, because what you're saying there, and, and you're right, by the way, is that if you're talking just about money, like the only way to do these math, this is by far the cheapest way to do it. So, I mean, before we start talking about all these other fancy, right, this yeah. centralized way, there's no way you can do it cheaper than that. So let's yeah. just get that stake in the ground. I mean, the entire Aadhaar system runs on... What is that, a dollar a person to... Uh, dollar a person to, distribute, uh, to populate the database and currently runs from about 10 servers. So... Not I mean, bad. it was designed very lightweight. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, uh, sorry, you were going to say that's I, not the cheapest way of doing it. Well, I don't know that it, it depends how quickly you want it to be cheap. So centralized infrastru infrastructure might be cheap in the first instance for some economy. You were talking about India, but it, it might be that actually if you started now, you might not build any centralized infrastructure because it might be cheaper to use all the standards just to write a playbook and then to allow individual organizations to build business models based on based on a playbook of, of rules where you've got Open ID Connect, you've got um, the FIDO Alliance. So I, I think it, it's an interesting question, the, the business model question, which goes round and round I'm in going, our heads. So. I'm going to take an issue with that, Victoria, which is there's a lot of debate right now happening in India because now there is Aadhaar, there is UPI, there's a whole stack of technologies which rely on Aadhaar, which are transforming India at a rate which is actually unimaginable anywhere else. Um, but, and, and there's a huge debate about, you know, the, this massive centralization and whether the government should have access to all of this data. And there's a uh, act in Congress that Parliament just passed. At the same time, I'm like, I much prefer a democratic government to have control over that sort of a data than a bunch of distributed entities who each have their own different business model. And I have absolutely, I mean, I trust the Indian government more than I trust Facebook, for example. I know that I have a vote in India and I don't with Facebook. That's, well, that's no longer a cost discussion. No, no, wait, I just want to challenge. Yeah, it's, it's a I just different want to discussion. Challenge, I want to challenge that. That is a different discussion. But I just want to challenge that because I, I want the because none of they've all been swearing, so all of their all of their questions have been cancelled because of because of the bad language issue, which we did talk about. So, but I just asked something instead. So, who? I mean, is that people say that as just to throw everything? Who genuinely trusts the government more than they trust Facebook? Who genuinely trusts the government more than? Oh, everybody. Okay, all right. All right, you can carry on. Sorry, I didn't... I, th I think it depends on what... That's uh, a fair uh, point. Okay, go to on. Do Not all governments, yeah, but... <laughs> it depends on where you go around the world, doesn't it? So, um, you know, the Finns and the Estonians trust their government a lot more than the British do. Um, and that allows um, these kind of well, centralised approach, like in, in Estonia, to, to work because they trust the government. But, um, okay, so that's, that's one stake in the ground. So we can have a centralised approach where... The government builds the stack, essentially, which could work. We could have a centralized trust framework, but individual organizations actually build the components and go to it. We could have the kind of federated version of that where there's one particular kind of organization which builds it, which obviously is banks. Who, who trusts banks more than they trust Facebook? Can I just check on that kind of thing? OK, good, we're on safe ground. OK, so, uh, so banks could potentially fulfill that role. Or everybody could fulfill it. We could go completely decentralized and let everybody do it. So let's just go back on the bank thing for a moment. So one way of doing it would be the highly cent And it's very hard to compete with the highly centralized version on pure costs. I, I take your point about the trust framework and interesting. Banks, why don't banks do this? So um, people okay, do trust. People hate banks. Mm -hmm. I hate BBVA, but I trust. No, I'm just pretending yes. to be a BBVI customer. So I, but no, because people hate yeah. banks, but they trust them. They, if, exactly. you, if you they, ask them in a poll, they say, oh, I hate the bank. Yes. But they do trust the bank to look after yeah, that's, things. Yeah, that's, that's very true. That's what all the studies say. People hate banks, and they trust banks. And uh, so in kind of if, if we use uh, um, an example from my home country, Finland, um, I, I've been living um, outside Finland the last 10 years, but, 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 but I kind of 
have followed is every time you do any kind of a, first it was a transaction that requires some sort of a KYC identity, is what do you do? You, you, uh, you use your bank credentials and you can basically log into any service. Now, that's how it started, but now it is anything that requires an identity. It doesn't have to be a verified a KYC identity, it's just some identity, and it has become the standard that everybody uses their bank ID. So it works, it was federated in, in the, I, I guess when you use the word federated in, in this sense, it is every bank is part of it. So, so that's the bank sort of issued the identities. Yeah, that, I mean, that sounds quite good, but that means you're using one identity everywhere you go, and does, doesn't that have some privacy implication? Just the same as you were saying, yeah, I, I, I think um, this is one of the issues with a centralized approach, um, is that whilst the, uh, the intention may not be to correlate you across everything you do, once you have that big pot of data and, you, and that data is being used, you have one identifier that's being used everywhere, uh, the temptation is to start correlating. Oh, what, what's this person doing over here? What are they doing there? And if, our, you know, if you're, the I, government ID scheme is then being used in the private sector and there's some way of seeing that, you end up with a kind of profiling Facebook-like situation. It may not be the intention, but it yeah. becomes a temptation. This is, actually, this is actually private ID being used by the government as well. So you want to go and do your taxes, you use this now. Uh, now, it doesn't, I think this leads to the question of what is identity and how do we define no, it. Uh, no yeah. one's allowed to say what is identity. Yes. That's a just, rabbit hole, Tepper. We yes. can't go down. Uh, know what is yeah, identity. But, but it's, it's an answer to this question partially because, you know, the, this doesn't include the Facebook. This doesn't include the well, digital, different we'll, we'll digital platforms. We'll circle back around to that in a yeah. moment. Dick. I think there are problems already about um, non-permissioned linking of data. So I, I think it's very culturally specific. So in Australia last week, a, a privacy pundit, I'm really glad we have privacy pundits, a privacy pundit successfully brought a case against Transport for New South Wales for linking his name, so identity, but his name with his travel journey because he'd applied for a concession card. And, and the court found that the Transport for New South Wales had, without his permission, followed his, his travel journey. And, and that's huge important. So I, I support Andrew's point about we need to think really, really carefully about how we join up, join the dots between people, and it has to be on a, a permissioned basis. So I don't, actually, personally, I don't care whether I have self-sovereign identity or whether I've hived off looking after that to a bank or, or a telco, um, but I think that it has to be permissioned, and, that, and I think that's the challenge that we all face. That's another big difference about having this discussion now compared to having it sort of five, six years ago, which is because now things like GDPR, privacy, and uh, those things now are an integral part of the design of digital identity systems, which I, I don't think they were in the past because of that sort of centralized version. Okay, let's just explore the last case before we, before we start taking the questions. So we, have, we can have a centralized one, we can have a framework, we can have the banks as the principal suppliers, and that works in many places. Or we could just decentralize it to the nth degree so that essentially anybody uh, could create an identity. So Andy, uh, why would I pay any attention to an identity that you create yourself? Um, well, I, think, I mean, I can uh, see why I would take a bank identity, right? But yeah. why would I take... Um, well, I think we shouldn't confuse self-asserted identity, which is what you just described, where you, you declare something yourself, and what's called self-sovereign identity. Um, they're two very, very different things. So um, let's, let's just look at uh, what we mean by decentralized identity, because it's a, a couple of buzzwords that uh, consultants like to use to impress clients. Uh, so we've had decentralized identity for a long time. So the government gives me, gives me a passport. I pay 72 pounds for that. And they give it to me, and I can take it anywhere I want. I can show it to you to prove who I am. And the government doesn't see that happening, right? Why would they? I'm, I'm showing it to you. And they, I get a driving license, and I can take this with me everywhere I want. Uh, the problem comes in the digital space where I can't do that. I can't give you that, okay, in the digital space. There's no generic way of doing it. Can I just quickly ask, have you got the slightest possibility of knowing whether that's real or not? So uh, wasn't it just, it's meaningless theater, him showing you that driving license, isn't it? You can't tell whether it's real or valid or... I 
can't and yet it bears a lot of uh, i can't and yet it bears a lot of the marks of a drive uh, that would indicate that a driving license. It has a watermark, it has the uh, the UK flag, and a lot so of other... It's a good forgery. It's a very good forgery. But <laughs> if the, it's a forgery, it's a very good one. What good is it to you? If he shows you his passport, who cares? It doesn't mean anything to you, right? Yeah. You, <laughs> you can't check it's real or not. It, well, this so is can a, we just yeah, move on from this? This is a really good point, actually. Okay. Uh, so imagine if you could have digital versions of these that you own and, and take with you, and when you present them, the person you're presenting them to, they can check if it's real. They can check who it's come from. They can check you haven't changed it. Um, so you can have some sort of digital, digitized versions of these which have some superpowers. Like you can only reveal a bit of it rather than all of it. Or I can take a bit from here and a bit from here and combine them to prove who I am and have different personas. Okay, so, so, in what, so what we're saying, Andy, uh, so what we're saying is that you're not actually just digitizing those and showing to you. You're doing something much cleverer, right? So we're not just trying to take the analog identity we have offline, put that online and call it digital identity. We're trying to do something different. Yep. We're trying to build identities that make sense, as McLuhan predicted, in this kind of online world. And yep. there are these different ways of doing it. Uh, you can see why now basically you're going to fight and push each, and the last person left on the stage is the way, that's, didn't we explain this to you before? Yeah. Because okay. of that, you need more than banks. I don't just exist with my bank, I exist with my, exist with a retailer. So I think that point about it, it, if it's bank, Led, I think it has to be wider, and I know in Finland it has built out yeah. wider. But you, people don't exist in in silos. But don't so you think have banks have a huge advantage in this space because they already have to do the KYC? They banks already have to do a lot of this stuff, right? I maybe today in some economies they do, but I think that the increasing number of data that's available, the ability to use that for organisations that aren't banks to use that in a deterministic way, I, I don't know that necessarily the banks will continue to have the, the lead in that. And I think it's more importantly about how people um, live and exist. And they have relationships with numbers of organizations that can assert certain parts of their identity. So I think giving people choice from the start. And I, I don't know if it's even a valid discussion. Do banks have an advantage over someone else? They have part of the picture. Well, somebody needs to issue the identity if it is if it is assumed to be a KYC identity, which means that it's somebody that somebody needs to verify it. Bank is a logical place. May not be the only government is a is a good example. Um, but but and then I, I think you were you were moving ooh you, you you were moving to another topic which is kind of the management of it well, and it's... and uh, you know how can I when I when I give it to somebody can I give it for one hour or one day can I only give this part of my identity and uh, we actually even have a startup that we have funded which does exactly that where you can kind of send this piece, but not that part. Okay, but, but even there, somebody needs to issue it first. No, but that, that's an interesting topic, right? So let, let's just pick up on that. So I can see on the question, so people are already asking a couple of questions. That's an interesting idea, but how exactly would it be done? So there is this idea of using social media identities, which I think is underexplored, right? Mm -hmm. if, if you were, where's the music coming from? Oh, okay. So, uh, if you said, uh, you know, should I give Andy a loan or not, Andy? So, if we're going to give him a loan, we could do it the traditional way by looking at credit ratings and things like that. Or actually, I would say for a lot of people in this audience, you could just look at LinkedIn. Like, if you wanted to see whether any of these people look credit worthy, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, none of them look credit worthy, obviously. But, but, yeah. but you would get a better idea by just going to LinkedIn. So, why don't we just use stuff like that? I so LinkedIn is just one of any number of credentials that you can have. I mean, it's not a, got a very high assurance level, as it's called, because a lot of the data is self-asserted. So if you had a LinkedIn with verified data that came from an employer and you could verify it came from the employer, then that would be rather more powerful. So I think the, the requester who wants you to prove something, it's on them to say what they want you to prove and what level of assurance they need. So if I show my passport, I, this passport got me into the country, so it's good for getting me into the country, I couldn't get into the country with my driving license. It's Singapore border control that decides they want to see a passport. So if somebody decides, okay, I'm happy with seeing um, uh, something from LinkedIn or Facebook, 
then that's up to them, and that's fine. So they but but, but isn't, this, isn't Dave actually going to the next step of, well, how do you use it, and what are the use cases? And, and just saying that this is Andy or this isn't Andy is not enough for, for example, a credit decision. Yeah, right? it, it depends and, and, on... And, and, and there are actually quite, you know, if you look at, and this would not be supported by my colleagues, but, but my, my claim would be that the guys who are best at combining all of this data actually know a lot more about the person and that person's credit worthiness than a standard bank would with the standard banking data. But that, so. Which is where I come at the point, it, it doesn't have to be banks own that root of trust. There are other organizations that have that data that they can combine to give a, a high level of assurance. And if they want to take the risk on it, then that's fine. I think in payments, you see gateway providers now taking the liability for fraud. It's not banks. It's not the issuer. It's the gateway that's seen, here's a problem in the market. I'll enter the market by having a, a different model, and I'm going to carry the liability for anything that goes wrong. And they're doing that based on masses amounts of data and watching behavior. So why couldn't someone do that in the identity space? Yeah, data is changing. But I, actually, I, I was, but I was I was asking because I was going to push another thing, which is one of the other questions people are asking is about scaling across borders. And I'm sort of wondering if that doesn't privilege people. I mean, people like Google, Facebook, Amazon, global, everybody. You know, I mean, maybe in a way they're better placed to produce these solutions than some of the people that we think of as the identity providers. I mean, maybe the solutions lie outside those traditions. I don't know. I mean, there's no reason why. Uh a national identity system can't scale across borders, but that that, is, that becomes a governmental decision, right? I'm, the, I mean, Aadhaar isn't available outside India, but it could be, but it would have to be another government that would have want to deploy it, um, and that but, might happen in the future. But in, but in theory, that would be like, if somebody comes from India to Singapore, why can't they open a bank account using their Aadhaar? I mean, that's what, that's what digital identity should do, shouldn't it? I think yeah. there's a... Um, quite a significant technical restriction to, to this. So at the moment, attempts to scale digital identities across borders like uh, EIDAS in Europe rely on lots of hubs interconnecting to each other. Yeah. And wherever you've got a hub, you've got friction and you've got restriction. Um, at the moment, national identity schemes do scale across borders with one of those. So if I got a digitized one of these and I could present it and the recipient can understand what it but means. But to be fair, the way that well, you well, well, check I that... Just, I want to challenge that for a second. No, so Who, who's from a bank here? <laughs> who's, who's from a bank? Not, don't listen to Tep. Who's from a bank in the audience? Come on. Okay, so if, in, in Singapore? Australian. Oh, Australian bank. Okay, we use that as an example. So if I use my British passport to open an Australian bank account, basically all you do is take a photocopy of the passport and stick it in a drawer. You've got no way of knowing whether it's real or not. So how is that, right? So that's not scaling. That's pretend scaling. We, we, we want to set the bar higher. We want digital identity that means something, don't we? But I mean, in the passport world, the only way to verify it would be to access an API and feed the information through and then check with the UK passport authority or the US passport authority that what's in that passport matches the information there, at which point you're back to being a centralized system that can okay, track but, you. But now there's, there's a new way, okay? So the stuff we're doing, which is... Uh, ledger based, where you have a ledger with the public keys of the passport office on. So you don't need APIs anymore. So the receiving, the receiving person or organization, they receive the digitized version of the passport or the elements from it they want. And they go, oh, where's this come from? Oh, it's come from this identifier, which they know as the UK passport office. They look up the keys and they can verify the signatures yeah. okay. on that, okay? So that means you can get away from APIs and hubs and you can, you can scale massively because one end doesn't need to talk to the other end. The person acts as the hub, they bring the data, and they present it, and it can be verified. And the, the recipient can check who issued it. They can check you haven't changed it. You haven't wait, changed wait, wait, it. So I, I keep hearing this, like, this blockchain is going to fix everything thing. I've heard this a few times over the last couple of days. How is the blockchain? What are you going to you I don't think we blockchain. have to wait for the blockchain to fix anything. I think organizations like FIDO, who have got authentication across multiple platforms, across multiple devices, supported in browsers, working um, to to get authentication sorted out. And I think it's likely that we'll have sort of the different components of identity will be solved and 
um, countries, as they put together their national identity, will, will use those common standards. No one's going to invent a new standard for doing authentication now, are they? They're just going to use FIDO. So I think some of the work around making it actually how it works in the market will we'll build interoperability. We've got the GSM network. We've got payments. That all works across, there, there, there across a, the globe. Don't those standard. two things work together? Yeah, uh, there's, there's a new standard yeah. being created now at W3C level called verified, uh, verifiable credentials. Okay? And verifiable credentials are the things I was just describing that can be possessed by people and presented and verified by the recipient. Um, and the blockchain -y bit is for providing a decentralized key registry for anyone to check. So you don't, to point out, Dave, never put any personal data on the ledger. You know that, what's on the blocks, right? Not any personal data. So if we just put blockchain to one side for a moment, but just carry on that line, because it's an interesting line of argument. So what Vic is saying, is, which I think is quite an optimistic message, is hold on a second. Now we live in a world where we have standards and frameworks for this kind of stuff. Maybe a few years ago, it needed the government to come and define all these things and make these things happen. But couldn't we be more optimistic now about the ability of the industry to assemble solutions given these frameworks? Or, or, or is it, because there's a question there about why can't you use your bank identity to log into another bank? This is somebody who doesn't understand anything about banking or banking regulation or KYC, AML, or liability or this sort of thing. But, but it's a point. Right? I mean, you know, we already have all of those standards and frameworks. I don't think I'm over-egging the pudding by saying we already have all the things we need. So isn't there some way that as an industry, just financial services, isn't there some way we could somehow stimulate the development of solutions that fit inside those frameworks? Can well, we I mean, go back to a full circle to ADAR? Yeah, because you I mean, we can actually... No, no, we don't want the centralized solution. We already agreed on that, didn't but, we? Somebody but, just but, said... But, but regardless, you, you need a use yeah. case that drives adoption, right? Yeah. Technology by, itself is not enough. And by the way, you can actually do this. Like, you can, in India today, download an app from Google or PhonePay or WhatsApp, for example, link any bank account from any bank, and then send money to anybody else who has any other bank account in the country, and you can do that 24-7, 365. Next question. Can't you, can't you download anybody's ad hard? It's like $5, isn't it, to buy somebody's ad hard details no, or something? The, that ha, by the way, there have, been, there have been or issues where people have sold data. But those are... Uh, I mean, those have been patched, as far as I'm aware. And it was literally like... Uh, la, and... Um, officials at the end who are supposed to administer the system. And yes, there are always going to be leaks, uh, but there isn't any other way to serve a nation of that size. And I mean, you can say that, hey, we're sitting here and um, does, uh, doesn't everybody already have an identity and we'll put, uh, we'll put together an industry solution. There's still, what, 4 billion people no, on was, the planet who don't have an identity? I was, I was pushing Internet you guys account. in a slide. What I was saying was, you know, uh, why don't we have, instead of thinking about digital identity for everything, what if we just think about what would a financial services identity, like could we within the financial services sector use these standards and so on to develop a financial services identity, not a general identity that fixes everything? I get, that's where yeah. I was nudging with on I, that. If I just chip in on that one, imagine if... Because Vic's if, optimism, I think, if every, Yeah, well, if think every bank has KYC people to some degree, right? So they know name, address, date of birth, they know they've got a bank account, how long they've had it. Um, wouldn't it be great if the banks actually gave that information to someone? So uh, my bank could give me a digital version of that, and I could use it to prove my address to an online retailer, for example. Retailers would love that. So the banks can have this amazing, have this amazing ability well, that to kick That doesn't seem like a big ask. Why can't things. we do that? What's, what's the barrier to that happening? I you think, sit on all these committees and things. Why so isn't I think it happening? The, the, the barrier is that, that you have to have some sort of interoperability so that payments work. If you think about EMV, it works because everyone has the same piece of software on their chip and it can talk to the terminal. And everyone who's building terminals and, and, and cards with chips knows what they've got to put in, in the chip. And we don't have that for identity, actually. So we don't it, have that, that easy... Um, a set of standards that deliver technical interoperability to give portability. And the, the liability is another question because I think that liability is, is very different. There's a whole discussion around how that would work internationally and, and nationally, but we don't have technical interoperability there, to make that happen. Isn't there a very simple, selfish business uh, perspective, which is behind the identities data, if you get my data, you can compete with me 
more efficiently. That's so the, why would I want to give it? That's the biggest problem, right? Like the. I'm sorry, the bell's gone. Ah. Uh, ding, ding, ding. So I, de I declare Andy the winner on a technical knockout, ladies and gentlemen. I declare. Yay. Thank Listen, you so much. Please come on. Look. These people are real experts. They didn't know what questions they were going to be asked. They gave you their honest opinions about things, and I really appreciated that. I hope you did too. Please join me in thanking them. You guys were great. Thank you. No, I didn't want the microphone. I was going to say thank you. I'm going to do the microphone. That was great. Thank you very much.